17-year-old Natalie Putt lived with her infant son and her father in the Lower Gornal area of Dudley, a town in the West Midlands of England, around 10 miles from Birmingham. Natalie was born in the Welsh town of Aberystwyth and raised in nearby McKinleth. At the age of nine, following the passing of her mother, Natalie moved to the Midlands to live with her father, David Putt. Natalie's heart, however, remained in McKinleth. She regularly returned to visit family and always vowed to one day move back there. Natalie had two half-sisters, Rebecca and Lowry. She was particularly close to her elder sister, Rebecca, who was nine years her senior. It seems that, following the loss of her mother, Rebecca was a strong female role model in Natalie's life. Natalie briefly lived with Rebecca when she was 14 years old and was bridesmaid at her wedding. Rebecca describes her sister as kind, vivacious and a friend to anyone. Though Natalie was no pushover, she was feisty and could certainly hold her own. Natalie took great pride in her appearance and would always leave an impression with her jewellery and charismatic personality. Natalie did have something of a turbulent childhood. Her parents separated when she was young and a bitter custody battle ensued. She then had to contend with the grief of losing her mother, who was aged just 41, while adjusting to life in a new city, all by the age of nine. In her teens, Natalie's rebellious nature would begin to get her into trouble at school, and eventually she would be temporarily excluded from mainstream education. It was while excluded from school that Natalie attended a short course. It was on the course that she met 16-year-old Kevin McCallum. Natalie and Kevin's relationship moved quickly, and the pair were soon seeing each other every day. Natalie fell pregnant within months. Rebecca says that Natalie had always wanted to be a mother and to have her own family. She also says that, after falling pregnant, her younger sister really began to settle and mature. Kevin would later describe the relationship as, quote, fine and normal. He said that Natalie would occasionally be unhappy with him when he went out on nights out with friends but that things very rarely got heated between them. Rebecca describes things very differently, however, claiming that her sister's relationship with Kevin was tempestuous. She suspected that Natalie had become unhappy in the relationship during her pregnancy. At the time, Rebecca felt that, were it not for the pregnancy, Natalie and Kevin's relationship would likely have fizzled out over time. In June 2003, Natalie gave birth to a baby boy who she named Reese. Natalie was instantly besotted with her baby son, and he became her whole world. Rebecca reports that Natalie was an excellent mother, and that was later backed up by a midwife, who confirmed that Natalie had really taken well to motherhood. Natalie and Kevin lived separately, Natalie with her father in an area called Thorn Lee, and Kevin with his mother in Briley Hill. Though Kevin would occasionally stay over at Natalie's house to help with night feeds, Around six weeks after the birth of baby Reese, Natalie told Kevin that she wanted a break from the relationship. The drastic changes in her life brought on by the arrival of her son led Natalie to do some soul searching. From this, she decided that she needed to make some changes in her life. It's unknown if, as Rebecca suspected, that the relationship had simply run its course or if something more had led Natalie to this decision. And so the two began an agreed break in their relationship. Natalie had a pet pony. She kept this pony on private land owned by the family of an acquaintance of her dad, a young man by the name of Chris Millard. Natalie and Chris met when Chris sold Natalie's dad a horse. The pair initially started out as friends, but after agreeing a break with Kevin, Natalie began to spend more time with Chris. Chris Millard would be one of the last people to see Natalie Putt alive. Natalie spent the day of August 31st, 2003 with Chris Millard. The pair attended a horse fair with baby Reese, Chris's dad and a group of friends. At the end of the day, the group went to the pub and it was at this time that Natalie called her dad to tell him that she and Reese would be spending the night at Chris's house. She also told her dad that she planned to speak with Kevin the next day to officially end their relationship.
The next day, Monday, September 1st, 2003, at around 8am, Chris dropped Natalie and Reese off at her home in Thornley before driving off to work. Kevin was already waiting for Natalie. David Putt was at work and it was just Kevin and Natalie at the house. From this point on, all we have to piece together the last moments before Natalie went missing is the word of Kevin McCallum and a neighbour of the Putts. At some point during the morning of the 1st, a neighbour two doors down from the Putts reported having seen Natalie. The neighbour claims that Natalie introduced her to baby Reese and that she seemed perfectly normal. Providing a timeline of events, Kevin would claim that he and Natalie had agreed to meet to discuss their relationship with a view to officially ending it. He claimed that there had been no argument and that the two had simply sat together upstairs, smoked and talked. Kevin then claims that around midday, Natalie said that she was going to buy some cigarettes, reportedly at a petrol station just a few hundred feet from her home. She intended, according to Kevin, to return straight away. Natalie left, and Kevin claims to have spent the next 45 minutes feeding his son. Later in the day, he claimed to notice that Natalie's phone was on a kitchen worktop. She had left it behind. If Natalie did indeed leave for the shop that day, she never returned home and has never been seen again. After not a single trace of Natalie was found in over 15 years, West Midlands Police requested a special inquest into her disappearance. The Crown Prosecution Service of England and Wales defines an inquest as a legal inquiry into the cause and circumstances of a death and are limited fact-finding inquiries. A coroner will consider both oral and written evidence during the course of an inquest with the aim of ascertaining if a person is likely dead and or the cause of death. Opening the inquest into Natalie's disappearance, Black Country Coroner Zafar Siddiq said, There has been a long, extensive investigation into the circumstances in terms of what happened or trying to identify what happened to her. Earlier this year, I had a request from West Midlands Police to consider opening the inquest to try to ascertain what actually did happen to Natalie. Because there has been no body found, I've had to apply for special permission from the Chief Coroner, His Honour, Judge Lucraft, to resume the inquest. This is not something I take lightly. It's something I've had to do after considering all the facts available from the information provided to me by the police in terms of their investigation going back a number of years. The Chief Coroner has now granted me permission to open the inquest. At the inquest, testimony was heard from Detective Sergeant Angela Baggett of West Midlands Police, Kevin McCallum, David Putt, Rebecca Coggins and Chris Millard. It was during this inquest that everything that had occurred in the investigation into Natalie's disappearance was revealed, starting from day one. Natalie was reported missing on the evening of Monday, September 1st, though it's not clear when the call to police was made, by whom, or what attempts were made to contact or find Natalie before the call was made. It was found that Natalie had left behind her mobile phone, her handbag and some vouchers for child benefit. She also hadn't taken any clothing or any other personal belongings. However, Natalie's bank card was found to be missing and has never been found. The police would report that there was no sign of a disturbance at the put home. Natalie had family all over the UK, all of whom were contacted and all of whom confirmed they hadn't seen or heard from her. Police questioned Kevin McCallum, who relayed to them how the morning of the first had unfolded. Chris Millard was contacted by David Putt, who asked him if he knew where his daughter was. He didn't. Chris explained to David and later to the police that the last time he'd seen Natalie was on the morning of the 1st after dropping her off at home with Reese. Rebecca Coggins didn't find out about her sister's disappearance until Friday 5th, five days after Natalie had been reported missing. Rebecca's frantic sister, Lowry, broke the news to her. The first thing Rebecca asked was, did she take Reese with her? When told that Natalie had left Reese behind, Rebecca instantly said, well, she's dead then. Speaking at the inquest, Rebecca was adamant that her sister would not have left her infant son behind, and for that reason, she knew her sister must have come to harm. 
When police spoke with Rebecca, they queried Natalie's mental state. She was a young mother, going through a breakup. Police thought it was possible that she may have been suffering with postnatal depression and may have either run away or harmed herself. Rebecca insisted that her sister was not suffering from postnatal depression and it's at this point that she reached out to Natalie's midwife who confirmed that she had no concerns about Natalie's mental well-being or her parenting. It's here that things get rather confusing. Rebecca was told by police in the early days of the search that Natalie had left a voicemail message with Chris Millard. They claimed that the message was received at 2am on either the 2nd or 3rd of September, either 14 or 26 hours after her vanishing. It's claimed that in the message, Natalie said she had left for Coventry, that she'd had enough, and words to the effect of, quote, everyone can do one. Rebecca asked to listen to the message as soon as police made her aware of it. However, they claimed that the message had automatically been wiped from Chris's phone after five days. This voicemail message, Rebecca would claim, is the reason that police kept Natalie's case as a missing persons investigation. Bizarrely, at the inquest, Chris denied having received a voicemail message and reiterated that the last time he heard from Natalie was on the morning of the 1st. It's unknown what the police response was to this. It seems unlikely that the voicemail message ever existed, which of course begs the question, why would the police have made this up? Rebecca reported that her sister had run away occasionally as a young child, but never went further than a friend's house and always returned. Police contacted local hostels and hospitals to no avail. David Putt stayed at a hotel while the police conducted a thorough search of his and Natalie's home nine days after her disappearance. During this search, a t-shirt belonging to Natalie was found in a black bin bag in the loft of the house. On the shirt was found two, quote, tiny drops of blood. The blood was found to be a match for Natalie, though police concluded that this was not enough to make any link to her vanishing. Police forensic experts later concluded that the blood pattern was not consistent with a violent struggle. Speaking about the t-shirt found in the loft, Mr. Putt said, I was told after about the t-shirt found in the loft. I don't know how it got there. Rubbish would usually be kept in the loft. The last time David Putt ever saw his daughter was the day before her vanishing when he gave her a lift. Mr. Putt took custody of his grandson and cared for him in the aftermath of Natalie's disappearance. During his testimony, Chris Millard described Natalie as crazy, fun, always up for a laugh and always wanting to be the centre of attention. Chris was aware of Natalie's relationship with Kevin and stated that Natalie hadn't told him about any concerns she had about Kevin. Chris said she wanted some time away, she was fed up with things, she just wasn't happy with things. Chris claimed that he didn't find out that Natalie was missing until either the evening of the first or maybe the next day, the second. He claimed that he had expected a call from Natalie at some point that day, but that she never got in touch. He had messaged her throughout the day, but didn't receive a response. He shared that Natalie never went anywhere without her phone and always replied quickly to texts. It was raised at the inquest that Chris had sold his car and bought a new one just a week after Natalie's vanishing. In his own defence, Chris claimed that changing his car was something he did often. Chris was also accused of not helping to look for Natalie, to which he responded that he just didn't know where to start. She'd vanished without a trace and was last seen at her home. Chris remarked that Natalie's dad, her baby and her pony were her all. After the inquest, Rebecca said of Chris Millard, I went into that inquest suspicious and came out thinking that Chris was totally in love with her. The main things I found out was that she was actually in a relationship. They'd probably been seeing each other for a month, maybe six weeks. Police searched nearby woodland and local bodies of water were scoured by specialist dive teams. Locally, a public awareness campaign was launched and people were asked to come forward with any information they may have in relation to the search for Natalie. From this, over the course of the early investigation, three sightings were reported, all of which were conclusively ruled to not be Natalie. This included the sighting of a woman matching Natalie's description seen boarding a train. Station CCTV was checked and it was determined that the woman was not Natalie. 
Kevin McCallum was questioned by police on several occasions after Natalie's disappearance. It was revealed at the inquest that Kevin had replaced the SIM card in Natalie's phone with his own SIM hours after she had vanished. He claimed that he did this because he had smashed the screen on his own phone. Kevin protested his innocence at the inquest. Coroner Sadiq asked him directly, quote, did you play any part in the disappearance of Natalie Putt? To which Kevin replied, no. When asked about the state of his relationship with Natalie and what he knew of her relationship with Chris Millard, Kevin claimed to not know what the relationship was between Natalie and Chris. He did confirm that he knew the pair had only started seeing each other after the agreed break in his and Natalie's relationship. Kevin admitted to being unhappy about Natalie's relationship with Chris, saying, quote, I wasn't too happy. I wanted to know who this man was spending time with my son. She felt she needed some space, time on her own. I wasn't happy with it. We would have phone calls over the break about our relationship. We didn't have any heated arguments. The inquest heard that in November 2003, just over two months since Natalie had been missing, West Midlands police were approached by a local taxi driver. The taxi driver told police that he had been called to Natalie's house on the 2nd of September, the day after her vanishing. The driver claimed that the caller had requested a larger vehicle and that the call was made at around 9am. The driver claims he beeped his car horn when he pulled up outside the put address in Thornley. He then claims that a man exited the property with a baby, a pushchair and four or five black bin bags. Kevin then allegedly loaded Reese and his pushchair into the rear passenger seats and loaded the bin bags into the boot of the car, refusing an alleged offer of help from the driver. The taxi driver noted that it took a considerable amount of Kevin's strength to lift the bags. The driver then claims to have driven Kevin and Reese the short journey to his mother's house in Briley Hill. The taxi company also claimed that a cab had been ordered to the address in Thorn Lee the night before on the 1st of September, but that no one had come out of the house. Kevin allegedly initially denied ever having called and booked a taxi. Speaking on the allegation of the taxi driver, Detective Sergeant Baggett said, quote, A man came out with four or five black plastic bags and then came out with a baby. A pram, black plastic bags were put in the back of the taxi. The taxi driver made a statement in November 2003. This was put to Kevin and he denied using the taxi company. We have evidence that his phone was used to make the call to the taxi firm. The taxi driver attended a lineup and failed to pick anyone out. Police confirmed to the inquest that they had evidence that Kevin's phone had been used to place the call to the taxi firm. They also claimed that the driver in question had failed to pick Kevin out in an identity parade. Confusingly, at the inquest, Kevin seems to admit to booking a taxi but denied putting bags in the vehicle, he said, quote, I never said I didn't get a taxi. I'm saying the taxi driver is a liar. I want to make sure the truth comes out. I didn't put anything into the taxi. In December of 2003, the garden of Kevin's former home was dug up by police, though nothing was found during this search. A month later, in January 2004, Kevin was arrested and held for police questioning for 72 hours. He was subsequently released on bail. Kevin was never re-arrested and it's not known if police ever questioned him again in relation to Natalie's case. It's also not known if Kevin is still viewed as a suspect or a person of interest by West Midlands police. Speaking in his own defence at the inquest, Kevin said, quote, I was arrested on suspicion of her murder. I was released on bail. I had various interviews over the years. I didn't play any part in Natalie's disappearance. Kevin would also claim to have never been shown the bag of clothes that was retrieved from the putt's loft in which the blood-stained t-shirt was found. There was a further reported sighting of Natalie in Plymouth, 200 miles away from Dudley, in January of 2007. Again, this was proven to not be Natalie. In 2013, police received two new leads. The first, a tip from an unknown man in France. Details about this lead are unavailable, and it's presumed that this led to nothing. The second tip came from a member of the public, who claimed to remember seeing a man digging on private farmland in a village six miles from Dudley, known as Wombourne, 
An extensive police search of the area produced nothing. More recently, in June 2017, police began searching Royton Cemetery in Upper Gornal, located just two minutes from Natalie's home in Thornley. Police received the tip from a man who called from a telephone box in the Lake Street area of Upper Gornal. Police said they'd received, quote, specific information that has the potential to lead to the person responsible for Natalie's death, though nothing more specific than this is publicly known. Police were granted permission to disturb four graves in the cemetery. Nothing was found during this search. Police appealed for the caller to come forward, saying, quote, We would urge that person to contact us again, and we will ensure the information they have is treated with the strictest confidentiality. Cryptically, and in an apparent appeal to two people they believe are connected to the case, and to this new tip specifically, police said at least two people, quote, know what has led us to this site and they may have further information which could assist our search. It was at this time, after nearly 14 years and much pressure from Rebecca Coggins, that West Midlands Police confirmed that Natalie's case was now a murder inquiry. The final update from police was a search carried out in October 2017 of Ellows Hall Wood, a vast piece of woodland and nature reserve to the rear of the Putts residence. Officers searched the woodland, police dogs were brought in to assist, and a dive team scoured a pond on the reserve. Again, nothing was found during this search. It was confirmed by police to the inquest there had been no positive sightings of Natalie, that her bank account hadn't been used, and that there was no record of her having used any health or other public services since her disappearance. Speaking to the inquest, DS Baggard said, There doesn't appear to have been any reason for her to go missing. There didn't appear to be any disturbance at the address. Bin liners from the loft of the property were recovered and a t-shirt with a couple of blood spots on it were found. The DNA matched that of Natalie's. The hearing was told that the West Midlands Police investigation remains open but is not active. The inquest was over. Recording an open verdict, Coroner Sadiq said, I'm going to conclude the medical cause of death is unascertained. I don't know from the evidence and the circumstances how, sadly, she lost her life. I am satisfied that on the balance of probability, Natalie is deceased. It's likely that she died at her home address or in the near vicinity on September 1st, 2003. Natalie's family were granted a death certificate which listed her date of death as September 1st, 2003 and her place of death as her home in Thornley. To commemorate what would have been Natalie's 33rd birthday, Rebecca Coggins placed a stone atop her mother's grave in McKinleth which was inscribed with the words Natalie Put cruelly taken from us, 1st of September 2003, forever 17, beloved little sister of Rebecca, much missed auntie. Rebecca has remained Natalie's fiercest champion for the last 18 years, always pushing the police and fighting for coverage of her sister's case. Speaking in 2019, she said, There's a young man out there without his mum. Her family are without Natalie. We have nothing but those thoughts in our head of what happened to Natalie on that day. We will never, ever, ever give up searching for her. As long as I'm alive, I will keep on. Natalie Putt was last seen on the morning or early afternoon of Monday, September 1st, 2003. She is alleged to have left her home in Thornley, Lower Gornal, Dudley, just after noon, and is claimed to have been heading for a nearby petrol station. Natalie is described as a white female of slim build, standing at just over 5 feet 1 inch tall. She was claimed to be wearing a pendant necklace with the words Someone Special engraved on it. She was also claimed to be wearing a white hooded top. Natalie had black shoulder length hair, blue eyes and a pale complexion. Anyone with information in Natalie's case is asked to call the police non-emergency line on 101 or Crime Stoppers anonymously on 0800 555 111.